Hi, my name is Anne McElhenney. And I'm Phil McAleer. And welcome to the Anne and Phil Scoop. It's week 101 of the two weeks to flatten the curve lockdown. Yes, two, that was two weeks. Uh, the government said we're just going to have emergency powers for two weeks to flatten the curve. And I'm sure Justin Trudeau is uh, going to just have two weeks of his emergency powers to get rid of the truckers in Ottawa. Two weeks, of course. It's ne- uh, We've never heard of the likes of a government ex- extending emergency powers long after the so-called emergency that wasn't an emergency uh, passing by. So on the show, very important, we're going to be talking to... Uh, we're going to be talking to Harvey Weinstein's defence lawyer. And I know you may well be thinking, why do we want to hear about Harvey Weinstein? It's very important for anyone who cares about the rule of law and justice. The laws are not to uh, protect nice people. They're often to protect horrible people, and that protects us as well. So the, what you'll want to hear the, the Weinstein case. And I swear, I tell you, it is worth listening to, and it is scary. What else is on? Also, we have... Uh California has ri- has lifted the mask mandate, but except for one group, but we'll, yes, we'll get to an that. An important group, yeah. And BLM have a big money issue, and it's not what you think. So the New York Times has finally admitted what a cesspool CNN is, a cesspool news network. Um, but of course, leave out details that a simple Google search could have shown. That's the thing. When, when, you, when you see a, an article that doesn't even use Google, you know they're hiding something. Mm-hmm. So we're going over now to our interview with Damon Sharonis. Damon Sharonis is one of Harvey Weinstein's lawyers. He, he covered the uh, the trial in New York. Um, and you may remember, we covered the Harvey Weinstein trial. We were in the, in the courthouse every day. Um, and we made a, a daily podcast reenacting the most dramatic evidence uh, from the trial. Uh, and... The truth of the Harvey Weinstein story is is not what you think. And it's very important to get that truth out there, especially if you l- love the rule of law mm-hmm. uh, and equality under the law. It's very important. So if you're conservative and you think you, you, if the rule of law is important and equality under the law is important, then even for people like Harvey Wein- Weinstein, uh, with his personal behavior and his radical political beliefs, uh, believe us, when we tell you that the way Harvey Weinstein was treated at trial is very important for conservatives and those who care about the truth. So let's go over and discuss that with his defence lawyer, Damon Sharonis. This is an interview we did earlier. So we're joined now by Damon Sharonis, uh, who was a lawyer for Harvey Weinstein um, uh, in his New York trial. Harvey Weinstein is, is currently serving 23 years in prison for rape, and he recently had a, an appeal hearing in the New York Court of Appeal. And on, unlike the trial, this was barely covered in the media. And as you know from this show, when the media don't cover something or are not curious about something, there's a reason for it. And it's a reason they don't want to talk about it. So when they don't want to talk about it, we want to talk about it. That's why we have Damon Sharonis on the show. Now, Damon Sharonis was Harvey we- one of Harvey Weinstein's uh, defense lawyers. Welcome to the show, Damon. Thanks for having me. Good to see you guys again. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, Damon, we sat through the trial every day. You sat through the trial every day. Um, I, I was there every day. I, yes, certainly. <laughs> certainly you build for it anyway. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, no, you were there every day, and it was, it, it was, it was. We we have covered a lot of trials in our journalistic career. This was a unique trial in in many ways. I mean, we hear a lot. You hear the words "mob justice" used uh, to, about trials and that, but this is actually one of the first trials I've ever been in where there was an actual mob outside the court for a lot of the trial and sometimes the mob seemed to come into the courtroom you know you had the journalists there not reporting what was the evidence given but also bizarrely the judge the judge was stretching in in my opinion and i think this came up with the appeal too he was stretching court procedures in new directions and unprecedented ways First of all, tell us what a Sandoval ruling is and what Molyneux rulings are. And we, I want to get on to how the judge used them in the court. Sure. Uh, first, you know, I want to thank you, the two of you, because during the course of the trial, I thought you were the most fair reporters of, of what occurred uh, in the courtroom. You didn't see a lot of that. Um, so hats off to you guys for doing that. I thought thank it was you. very commendable. Um, uh, regarding one of your initial statements, then I'll get into Mol- Molyneux and Sandoval about mob justice, um, you know, I've never been in a situation anywhere near this, and I've handled some high profile cases, nothing to this level, but it really hit me when I was conducting uh, questioning the jury, and you hear the chanting out of the courtroom, because there was actually a mob, uh, you can call it what you want, a demonstration, a group of people, a mob, I guess it you know, doesn't matter what you call it, but I remember seeing the look on the prospective faces when they heard that, 
And it was clear what they were saying. And of course, I raised an objection to it and asked for a mistrial or to dismiss the panel. But yeah, the overarching feeling towards that trial was that uh, the verdict was sort of a fait accompli mm -hmm. and uh, the entire system was sort of geared towards reaching that point. Of course, we did everything we could to try to stop that from happening. Um, but to your question about Molino and Sandoval, you know, those, those motions were litigated before we came on as attorneys, but we sort of relitigated them throughout the course of the trial. Uh, Molino, which is, as you remember from the appellate argument, certainly something that the appellate court justice is really focused on. Um, it's really proof of other crimes evidence is, is sort of the, the way I would describe it in maybe layman's terms. In any type of criminal trial, you want, I think society wants, I think you know people want to judge an individual on their conduct that they're charged with, because that's really the only fair way to do it. If you did it another way, trials would be different animals. They would be passion plays about whether somebody's a good person or a bad person. You would get into all of this extraneous material. And what would happen is jurors would get lost mm -hmm. and they couldn't focus on the allegations that were charged and they would get caught up in you know, whether somebody's a good or bad person. And that's not what trials are about, right? That's what the media does. That's what happens at town hall meetings, but not criminal trials. So what the Molino rule really says, and what's interesting about it, is that this other crimes evidence is presumptively inadmissible, right? So we start from the proposition that this is not coming into evidence. And the reason it's not coming into evidence is not because it isn't relevant at all. It's too relevant. It's too powerful. It's too significant. And it is too dangerous because it will infect the jury and it will make them decide a case on the wrong criteria, okay? So that's the starting rule. So there, like everything else, you know, a lawyer told me when I was a young defense attorney that the rules weren't made to help my clients, right? And I think I've seen that play out through the last 20 years of doing this, but like any rule, there are exceptions to those rules. And in this case, uh, the government obviously was successful in arguing that these other crimes pieces of evidence should come in to establish basically a, a pattern of behavior on behalf of Mr. Weinstein. That's what it really was. They may have couched it in different terms, but they wanted to establish things like, well, this will show that these individuals didn't consent or what his intent were, uh, what his intent was throughout the course of this. And what happens then is judges look at this and they look at the precedent and they have to determine one, is it relevant, right? That's the key to any piece of evidence in any case. Is it relevant? What is it gonna prove? Um, and once you determine it's relevant, you have to do a balancing test. And that's something that the appellate court really focused on because trial court judges need to balance the need for the evidence, the probative value of it against the unfair prejudice that could befall a defendant. So it's, it's a scale. You ask yourself, did the state need this evidence? Well, mm -hmm. probably not because they had three charged victims in the case, mm -hmm. right? So what probative value is there of including Dawn Dunning's testimony or Tarali Wolf's testimony or Lauren Young's testimony? What does that really do? How does that move the needle? And our argument was it really didn't yeah. because whatever happened with those individuals had nothing to do with what happened with the, the charged complainants. So we didn't think it was relevant in the first instance, but even a stronger argument than that was how is a jury, and these are normal people, these jurors, they are people like, you know, lay persons, how are they supposed to look at the charges and not be overwhelmed by this yeah. other crimes evidence, right? Yeah. So the prejudicial yeah. value of that is so significant because it allows the government to make the argument, even though they don't make it expressly because they can't, that this is a bad person, that he has a history of bad conduct. So find him guilty because this is who he is. And that is antithetical yeah. to our criminal justice system. It is antithetical to our notions of due process. Yeah, I mean, so I that's, wanna, that's I, my take on, on all in all. I want to play Barry Cammons, who was who's the other defense, one of the other defense lawyers, him addressing the Court of Appeal. And, you know, it kind of sums up just how unusual this was. Let, let's play that clip now. I'm Barry Cammons on behalf of Harvey Weinstein. I want to begin with the juror issue, Your Honor. But before, I just wanted to state very briefly that the trial court's rulings on both the Molyneux and Sandoval issues were unprecedented. 
and not the straightforward rulings that should have been made as in any other criminal case. And these rulings cumulatively prevented Mr. Weinstein from taking the stand in his own defense and from getting a fair trial. Didn't you were un unusual, your, unusual, Your Honor, first because the Sandoval ruling uh, is unprecedented in that it allowed 28 prior acts to come uh, to be uh, used against the defendant should he have testified. So th there you go. He says, you know, it's unusual. 28 prior <coughs> acts to come to be used against the defendant, you know, and he said that prevented, uh, that, that, that was, that was, that wasn't so much Molina. That was, a, yeah. uh, you know, his, that he's a bad person in other ways. Um, well, Sandoval, I, yeah, Sandoval is different. Do you want me to talk a little bit yes, about that? Yes. Okay. So Sandoval, we don't have, I practice in Chicago mainly and in state court, you really don't have Sandoval evidence. It, there's a hybrid of it in federal court uh, under what's called federal rule of evidence 608B. But in New York, the prosecution basically gets to get a pretrial ruling saying if defendant A testifies, we are going to be able to admit or ask questions about these prior bad acts, right? And the court makes a pretrial ruling to determine whether this goes to their character for truthfulness or things like that. What happened in this case is, you know, there was really no balancing. The judge sort of opened the barn door and we were in a position where had Mr. Weinstein decided to testify, he would have been deluged with some of the most ridiculous claims that had nothing to do with the trial, yeah. whether he yelled at somebody, whether he punched his brother, things that had nothing to do even with his credibility. Exactly. And what I think happened and what, what happened during this trial, and which is very scary, and, and it is a tactic that is used, is the government will put forward a hundred bad acts, and then the judge lets in 28. And they say, oh, well, the judge kept out, you know, however yeah, many, yeah, yeah. because they just threw everything at, the, but that's still not balancing. I mean, it was, it was, it was crazy. So it chilled, it, it effectively yeah. chilled his, his right to testify. Yeah, it chilled his yeah. speech. I, actually, I, I, so that's soundable at Molino. I want to get back to Molino because look, we were there in the <clears> trial <throat> every day. The women, you know, they kind of all look the same, the young model type, tall women, um, and all the incidents were in the same places. So, you know, he socialized in these four or five hotels. Some things happened in Cannes and London. By the end of the trial, we were getting confused between the different uh, women, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And That's as true. you say, we and we were there, and we were we were covering it as journalists. And and some and many of those women, he wasn't being charged for those offences, but they were able to bring in these these allegations, uh, unproven allegations against him. So. Of course, the jury were confused, uh, and of sure. course, they were left with this general impression that that this is a bad person. One of the scenes I remember most in the trial was uh, at the end, while we're waiting for the verdict, and someone was too it was, it was stuffy in the courtroom, and your colleague asked the judge, um, uh, you, the lady colleague, what was her name? Donna Rotuno. Da uh, Donna Rotuno asked the judge, you know, could we open the window? And the judge said, no, no, actually, it's fine, you know, and and, yeah. and, and Donna just went, judge, give us something <laughs> like, yeah, he, I mean, I think I think there was a lot of frustration uh, throughout the course of the trial on our part. I mean, and and, you know, when you're in the middle of it, you know, you're in this battle and, you know, you're working 18 hours a day, you're not eating, you're not seeing your family, you're losing weight, you're trying to, you know, make sure that, you know, you, you've prepared and everything's ready. And so you're in this bubble, but when you look back on it two years later, it really crystallizes what was sort of going on at that trial. And with hindsight, you get to really look at sort of what a disadvantage we were at and how, because this man was labeled what he was by society, it seemed like due process went out the window yeah. and it was shocking. And everybody should worry about that, right? Not just whether you're a liberal or a conservative or whether you like Harvey Weinstein or you don't, because the process is really what matters more than anything. And that, to me, uh, is the biggest takeaway from this trial. And some of the people who are writing about it now are starting to breathe some life into that because maybe it's a little safer to do that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. one of the things I kind of want to get back to the actual trial because a lot of people maybe don't, are listening to this don't know all the details. And <clears throat> it's interesting when I mention it to people and I just say Harvey Weinstein, people, oh, God, what a scumbag or whatever. And I'm going, um, yeah, you know, actually, it's not a crime actually to be a scumbag uh, and other, other words that they use. But I think they at the center for people to know that he was convicted by two, two 
separate um, rape assaults, right? One mm-hmm. 20 years and one three years. And I think for people to understand, certainly with my massive takeout, and I, here's my question to you. In all your years of meeting uh, rapists and you know bad guys and good guys and all kinds of people in the criminal system, have you <clears> ever <throat> once come across a case where a rape victim wrote hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails to her alleged rapist saying, I love you. I'd love you to meet my mother. Sure. And, so and that's my big takeout. Has that come out happened before? Well, I think, you know, in, in any case where there's an alleged uh, sexual assault in this day and age, you look for uh, communication between the you know person who's charged and the accuser. In my career, I have had a number of cases where I have seen accusations and then I've been able to get evidence that cast it in a different light, text message, emails, nothing like this though, right? Nothing like this. I mean, um, I was, you know, I, part of me wanted to just scream what's happening here, right? What, what is going on? Are we all just checking our common sense at the door? And, and the great thing about it is it's got nothing to do with whether you believe he did or didn't do something, right? You know, and that's a hard thing to understand. And, and, and you know, my position during the trial is the same as it is now. I said in my opening statement that I believe he was innocent and we made those arguments, but it's really a matter of proof, right? How can you reconcile those types of emails and text messages with, you know, the prospect of convicting somebody beyond a reasonable doubt? So I definitely think there was reasonable doubt there. I've never seen it to the level that I've seen it in a case like this. Um, but, you know, yeah, it was it was shocking. Yeah, and I think the other thing just to mention as well, I think for me, I found it very shocking to sit uh, day after day in the courtroom, hearing this extraordinary um, evidence that you guys were, were bringing, um, really extraordinary. I mean, we, we watched on screen, we read those emails together um, in the courtroom, the jury were obviously reading them. And then to kind of come out of the court and realize that really that story wasn't being told anywhere, uh, as you say, except for Phelan and myself, <clears throat> were the only people. And because I, I, I thought this is an extraordinary story from a, even from a human drama point of view. Wow, look at what these women did. Um, yeah, t- kind two of points. Amazing. Two points on that. One, and I'm not going to mention any names, but one of the oh, go f- on. Most, oh, go on. No, no, no. <laughs> one of the most, and Donna will say the same thing. There was nothing better than finishing a cross examination at that trial. And having somebody from the press come up to you and tell you what a great job you did and calling the credibility of maybe one of the accusers into question. And then the next day you'd read their article in the paper where it would have nothing about how good the cross-examination was and it it would be inconsistent with what they said in court. And I think the problem was, you know, journalistic integrity being what it what it is, they weren't allowed to write anything good about about Harvey Weinstein. I don't think their companies or their or their publishers would have allowed them to do it. So yeah. that's one aspect of it. Um, you know, the other aspect of it regarding uh, regarding sitting in court and, and watching that evidence, you know, it, it played out the way it is. But but the press saw it. You know, and it was great when you were trying a case and when you were cross examining and you were making good points. You'd hear all the the clattering of the of the laptops going. So you know, the jurors would look up when they heard that because it meant something exciting was happening. So yeah, no, it was to me. It, I don't know why it wasn't reported on accurately, but you know, I've got my my ideas. Just like nobody reported on the appeal, right? Nobody. Yeah. Even, even, yeah. even more so. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you 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 hit the nail on the head earlier, though. You said you know, conservative or liberal due process is being thrown out the window <clears throat> here and it's of course it's it's great you, you you know someone like harvey weinstein he's a he's a no one likes him right uh in the sense well that, i wouldn't say no one i know I'm, I'm i'm saying you know conservatives don't like him because of his political opinions and liberals don't like him because of the way he treats women or whatever so therefore they're using he's a trojan horse sure uh to to undermine the rule of law uh, and 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 the proce- process of justice i mean let's not forget he was the first Me Too person. It was important to get this scalp, right? Yeah. And, you know, if, if conservatives are sitting back there listening, saying, well, I don't care about Harvey Weinstein, they're coming for you next. Yeah, they're coming for you next. They're it's, using- the old, it's, it's, the old, it's the old adage, you know, who's going to be able to stand up for you if you don't stand up for those people? Yeah. And I agree. And, you know, part in my practice, I always find it interesting when I get hired by somebody who's never been in trouble before right? Who's never, and I have a lot of those clients, a lot of white collar clients or doctors or lawyers or people who've never been in trouble before. And when the government comes knocking on your door, then you start thinking more about it and you start talking about due process and you start talking about your rights. At the end of the day, all we wanted was fairness. That's all we wanted. 
And it's scary because, you know, Mr. Weinstein, Harvey needed protection in that room from people other than his lawyers. Um, he needed, uh, you know, some more, I think, judicial monitoring of the evidence. And it's scary because when the system breaks down and when due process is put to the side to get to a desired result, that's scary for everybody because if it can happen to Harvey Weinstein, it can happen to anybody. Yeah, and anyone. this was, this was, this case was beyond, right? Because like you said, both sides had their minds made up about Harvey Weinstein. A lot of people didn't know the facts. A lot of people didn't care. And one of the things that I really had hoped, um, maybe in retrospect, was I think that the perception of this trial would have been completely different if it was if it was on TV, if it was videotaped. Yes. And I also think it may have been a different trial. There may have been different different things that went on during yes, the course yes, of the trial. Yes, yes, but yes. I, I think that the like you two are perfect examples. You were in court every day. You know, I'm not saying we did a great job every day or not, but we presented the evidence and you had, I thought, a realistic objective take on the evidence and you reported on it. I think if the world sort of saw what happened in that courtroom, um, not that everybody would, you know, have a free Harvey sign up right now, but I think they know more about the process and they would probably see that, uh, you know, there were injustices along the way leading to that conviction. I mean, there, was, there were people there, you know, as I say, who, who, who had hundreds of emails, loving emails to Harvey Weinstein. They never once used the word sexual assault. They never once used the word rape. You know, in the emails. I mean, the most, you know, in the emails, in any communications with them, the first Harvey Weinstein knew that there was something <clears throat> wrong with this relationship was when the police came knocking on his door years, uh, later. years later you know and uh, he was very lucky by the way that the emails were preserved yeah you know? oh yeah i mean you know? i mean I, I don't know how lucky he is right yeah. uh, no, but but, but 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 i think that those were some of the the most powerful pieces of evidence and and i will be the first one to say you know um a victim of sexual assault there is no like, you know, set pattern, how somebody's going to respond to it. And, and I mean that, you know, from a, from a personal perspective, yes. people don't always run to the police right away. People are traumatized and it's a very terrible thing that they go through. So I am not, I'm a firm believer that just because somebody doesn't call the police right away, doesn't mean they weren't victimized, right? We know that we're beyond that. Um, but I just looked at the, the quality and the quantity of these emails. And not only did they not make allegations of sexual assault, uh, they did the opposite, right? Yes. They were loving emails and let's meet up and let's talk. And can you do this for me? And can I get this job? And can you meet my mother? And and when you when you get that much, we're not talking about one or two instances where maybe somebody lets an email slip. We're talking about a a, a slew of them yeah, uh, that exactly. at least raises reasonable doubt. That's yes. what it raises. Yes. Exactly. And in, and in the case of, and I, again, as Phil mentioned, there were so many people's names mentioned, I get them confused. But in the case of one of the alleged victims, um, where she apparently was um, raped, assaulted, and the following day got in touch with uh, Harvey Weinstein's office, asked to be flown to London, uh, was flown to London. She just, she's California, like, what? To, to what? California. What about the woman who went to, to went to London and then subsequently was in London and got back in touch with his office and said, oh, I've just found out that Harvey's going to be coming to London. Yeah, and that was the I same. That was the same person. So after the alleged person. assault that that woman, Miss Haley, flew to California and then we introduced emails, at least where it showed that she wanted to change her flight to see him in London because uh, he was out there with somebody else. So yes, yeah. that, that's the same person, just, you know, there's a lot and, going on. And as you say, it's just, it just defies common sense that, you know, as you say, in the end, this is about common sense. And it's like, does this ring true? Does this seem reasonable? Um, and does this, does this pass that, that bar of, you know, but, reason, but, but, reasonable doubt? This is, but this is also interesting that it kind of works back into the whole Molyneux issue, right? Because when you include other uncharged acts and when you include this sort of you know deluge of, of other people it's harder for the jury to focus on the charged counts yes. because totally. they are getting battered so it's all connected right so you're sitting back there and you're compartmentalizing this and you're saying well these emails didn't make sense and i had reasonable doubt and i'm sure some of the jurors thought that as well but maybe some of the jurors also said well man we heard from these three other witnesses yeah. and where there's smoke there's fire yeah. and he's a real bad guy and let's just convict him that's the problem with that 
that type of evidence because and, it takes the focus yeah. away from the charge counts. Look, look, totally. We were getting confused between the, and you know, you can hear it almost here now with us. We're confused about the different, and some of them he was being charged with, uh, and some of them were just being allowed awesome. to tell a story, and there was no charges there. And but talking of jurors, I mean, <clears throat> then we had juror was at number eleven uh, who was writing a book. Mm -hmm. about well let's you know let's let uh, barry cammons describe what was going on there getting back to the juror your honor she misled the court she obfuscated she which is a, a nice word of saying that she lied to the court and she had an economic interest her 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 professional interests were tied to the outcome of of this case she wanted to get on this jury she had an economic reason for wanting to get on the case she had an economic reason for wanting to convict the defendant yeah, so as, as he says, she had an economic incentive to convict Harvey Weinstein, but the jury, the judge let her stay on the jury after he after she lied and, and then still had an economic incentive. Is that unusual? Well, I mean, I think my take on, my, my takeaway on that juror at the end of the day, um, whether or not you take a position that she was being dishonest or whether or not you take a position that she was mistaken, whatever position you take, it, there was enough there. And there were so many other jurors where the judge should have exercised his discretion and said, we're just gonna strike this juror because there's enough where we have questions about it, right? So, um, you know, I, I know the juror issue for us was, was a big issue throughout the course of the trial. You know, I actually questioned that juror and I asked her a question. I said, look, does your book have anything to do with young women and, and, and men who could be considered predatory? Her answer was no, right? I can't get into her mind at the time I asked that question. Um, so what we did was we presented the court with evidence about that book, which talked about predatory older men. So what we said to the court was, judge, you know, whether or not, you know, you believe or disbelieve or discredit her, there's a problem here. And the problem is we now have evidence that this book is about predatory older men, or at least in part, because that's how it's being advertised. I asked her that question. She said, no, shouldn't we at least in an abundance of caution strike this juror because we've got about a thousand other people waiting to be on this jury. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then during the course of the trial, it came out that books were being read or reviewed. So yeah. I, I really thought that was a significant issue. Obviously the appellate court wanted to focus more on the Molyneux stuff, but yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a very significant. Yeah, I just, issue can I just trial. add, it was a really bad book as well. Oh God, you read the book. Yeah. It's really badly written. Um, I, I didn't read it. Um, and I don't want to comment on that, but I do know that there was a character. Somebody told me there was a character named Damon in it who oh. was not, who was not cast in the best light so i hope that oh. i hope that wasn't changed because of me but i didn't read it um you know I, I skimmed it a little bit where where is harvey today he's in los angeles you know i just talked to him a couple days ago i keep in touch with him um, and, how, and how is he doing and how is his health you know I, I will say this about about him and i have no no qualms saying this i don't care what anybody thinks about me i'm a criminal defense lawyer over the course of that trial he and i developed a friendship um i still keep in touch with him for everything that he's gone through uh he's doing as good as he can be obviously he is um in a, in a difficult situation but i think he's keeping his spirits up i think the questions by the new york appellate court um hopefully you know livened his spirits a little bit. I think it gave us all a little bit of a, you know, an up an uptick based on their questions and, and hopefully an eventual reversal. But, you know, he's hanging in there. He's got a new team of lawyers out in California who are preparing for that trial. And I wish them the best of luck. I haven't had a lot of contact with them, but if they need anything from me, I, I try to help them. But he's doing the best he can, right? And, I, and he is a survivor and he has, I think, a, a very strong will. And I think at the end of the day, he just hopes that, you know, people listen and look at the, the trial for what it was. And if there were errors that the appellate court recognized them and give him the right to a fair trial. Mm -hmm. And how is the, uh, how's the prison? Is it, is it as miserable as we might? Imagine? Well, you know, I mean, prisons, it's funny. I've spent a lot of time in prison myself or jails. <laughs> uh, I've probably done a couple of years just visiting yeah, clients, yeah. but when you're in a County jail, that can be a really rough place. You know, if you're at a penitentiary, not that those are walks in the park, but, you know, county jails are very difficult places and that's where you're held pending a trial. So, you know, it's it's not um, the peninsula. It's not a nice sure. place to be. Um, so he's doing the best he can, right? He hasn't given up and he's fighting the good fight. And, um, you know, that's that's where he's at, I think, mentally. And uh, how's his health? Or you know, I don't really talk to him about that. You know, I, I, I kind of leave that to him. I haven't heard anything about it in the news. 
Uh, I'm sure it's not great because it wasn't great when we were his attorneys, uh, when we were in New York and, you know, two years of being in custody probably doesn't do a lot for your, for your health. Is LA the end of this then after this trial in LA or? You know, I mean, there's no other cases pending anywhere, uh, you know, in a perfect world, uh, he gets uh, a reversal in New York and wins the case in LA. Um, but I think that, that those are the only charges that are pending right now. And if there was a reversal in New York, which I absolutely think there should be, um, then the Manhattan DA would have to decide whether or not they're going to charge him or try him again. I know the lead prosecutor is no longer with that office. Um, Joan Aluzzi, I believe, is, is retired or left. So they would have to decide whether to try him again uh, in New York. Is he hopeful about New York, about the appeal? I mean, I think, I think all of us, just from having watched the, the appellate argument, right, um, I think all of us have a renewed sense of hope about the outcome of the case. That's the best I can say. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to quote him or, or talk about what, what he said, but I know that, you know, I think he shares my feelings that there is sort of hope here uh, that, you know, and, and it's funny because, you know, our thought is justice to prevail would require and command a new trial. Right. And, and if that happens, you know, I think he would be more than more than elated at an opportunity to defend himself with different rulings. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the what's the calendar on that? What's the schedule on the um, the answer from New York? You know, I don't know. I, I read somewhere that it was going to be April. You know, I know I've written appeals and, and it's taken a long time for them to be ruled upon. So I, I guess, you know, when it's ready, it's ready. You know, I know the New York firm that we worked with and who worked on the appeal, we still keep in touch with. Um, but they don't have a definitive answer. Did you um, did you like the actor who played you in the in the po in our podcast? Oh, I don't, I, I don't know. I, it's, I haven't I, I haven't listened to it since the trial. But uh, <laughs> I do. I will say a funny story though. I remember you know somebody had sent me a text message about the, the person who was playing me on court TV, and I listened to it. And man, this guy was so mean, and he had this like southern draw, and he was like yelling at people. Not your podcast, but another no. one. So, no, uh, I think yours was a little better. I don't know if they quite got the Chicago accent down the yeah, way yeah. it needs to be, yeah, yeah. but it was it was good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Rose McGowan made allegations about him. Uh, other Hollywood celebrities. I mean, is there any sense of that uh, coming into a trial or? You know, I think, and I, I don't want to be quoted on this, but I guess that since I'm on TV, I will be, or I guess I will be quoted. I think her case, there was a, there was a, a, a civil racketeering case that I think was dismissed. I don't, I don't know if there's still a civil case pending with, with Ms. McGowan. I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think that that case may be resolved. Um, you know, and then who knows, right? Who knows? It seems like every time you, you, you Google Mr. Weinstein's name, Harvey's name, there's somebody else who wants to get their two cents in about something that occurred, you know, 20 years ago. So I, hopefully that this is the universe of what he has to deal with. It's certainly enough. Um, so well, I guess only time will tell. Has, by the way, has COVID affected his ability to have visitors? Um, has, I mean, is he very isolated? You know, I don't know. I, I don't know about what his visiting schedule has been. I know it's, I, I can just say that I know it's affected, you know, where I am, mm -hmm. it's affected that greatly. You know, I have to do Zoom calls with my clients. It's affected my ability to meet with clients in custody. I haven't tried, a, I tried a jury about two months ago, but I haven't tried a criminal case since New York. And I've got about seven this year. So I'm, I'm the, the COVID <laughs> debt is now about to get paid because, okay. uh, you know, the juries are starting up again and I'm looking forward to that for sure. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think that's that's uh, that's everything. I mean, you hire actually hire spirits. I mean, in general, I mean, obviously he's in, he's in prison. Uh, you know, he's in prison, but like I, you know, I enjoy talking to him. You know, we still talk about football every now and then. He still gives me. Uh, he still likes to cheer me up about being a Chicago Bears fan and thinking that I'm I'm more depressed than he is because I'm a Bears fan. Um, but you know, when somebody's in, incarcerated like that, you know, their spirits aren't going to be that high. But I think saying that, I think he's doing the best he can. And it's, um, it's admirable how he's handling the situation. Okay, that's great. Okay, okay. Um, right. that's great. Well, I think, th thank you very much for coming on the show, Damon. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll be watching very carefully to see what happens, uh, happens with the appellate court in New York. Um, and, yeah, just, and LA. And LA. Just, just don't read the New York Times because it's not in there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, we know. Oh, we know. <laughs> All right, guys, great to see okay. you again. Okay, All right. thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So I hope you understand that uh, 
Harvey Weinstein getting a fair trial is important. It's something that every one of us would should be very concerned about. Yes. And the idea that he didn't get a fair trial should be very, very worrying. Yeah. And we certainly don't think he got a fair trial. Um, and we would urge people, if they don't know a lot about it, to go and find our yeah. podcast. The, the, wine, the, the, the Harvey, Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein on the Harvey Weinstein trial on unfiltered. So yeah, go to the Harvey Weinstein trial unfiltered. Uh, you can get it on podcast. It's a day by day uh, reenactment of the trial, and you'll see just what a miscarriage of justice his conviction was. So the big news in California is that the indoor mask mandate expired, except for in Los Angeles County, where Ooh. the rules, of course, are different. But also all over California, which I think is actually the piece that I really want, because obviously LA County is just a crazy and crazy always. But I think the craziest thing for the whole of California is despite the fact that the man- mask mandate, indoor mask mandate, has been ex- has expired, children are still going to be required to wear masks in public settings. This is at school. You mean at school? Basically, at schools. Yeah, children are going to have to wear masks at schools. And because their teachers. Course, children, because children, of course, are so dangerous as a group for, in, you know, in this, in this crazy pandemic. Really, really horrible. It, it, it's unconscionable. So basically, as you know, Magda was talking about this earlier. I mean, basically, you can go as a grown-up in California into a pub, into a, into a tight setting, drink your head off, spit in the, the face of the person standing next to you at the bar. I want more alcohol! Or whatever it is that you might want to say for example, at a bar setting, uh, without wearing a mask, but children sitting neatly in their little desks and playing uh, in school. Unbelievable. They're putting these masks on them. And by the way, what's even How more, they awful, learn to to me, read what's even more awful to me is a number of parents who, who love it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Phil. Now, how are they going to learn to read and write if, if they're wearing masks? I mean, it, you know, so much about reading and writing is watching the teacher's mouth and pronouncing words and, and, and that's just gone. And how are they supposed to focus if they if they can't see the teacher's mouth it's just it's it's, it's a disaster it's 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 going it's going to set the you know LA up for a very 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 uneducated uh, generation of children no there's going to be the educational fallout from this is going to be enormous um, enormous I mean, and even the mainstream media is beginning to um, acknowledge that but the other story that and it's very funny about the I mean again back to the mainstream media and this is such a familiar theme here on this podcast but it, compl- it constantly amazes and upsets me, and I still get surprised by the mainstream media's failure and intentional failure yeah. to report the news that, that, that is extraordinary. So many of you have probably noticed, because you're reading beyond the mainstream media, you've probably noticed this story, extraordinary story, that Black Lives Matter... The Black they Lives will Matter, not account where the money is. Bla- so the Black... Well, first of all, you know, the, the latest news, basically, is that Amazon... You know, and we've told you, for example, that you can go when you're buying stuff on Amazon, and we'd like you to do that. Go to Amazon Smile, and uh, we are listed as one of the charities there, and you can offset some of the money to Amazon, and you can offset it, and it'll come to us. So don't you like that idea, Amazon, giving us money? But Amazon, Amazon have suspended Black Lives Matter as a charity on their platform. Why, Anne? Be- Why? Oh, is it because they? <laughs> is it because they were the cheerleaders for a, 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 a bunch of riots over the sum over where that tens summer? Of people died. Where dozens of people died, billions of dollars of property damage was no. done. No, funny no. enough, it's not. So that. you can you can kill your your charity can lead the, the movement to kill people and lead the movement to destroy property and lead the movement, by the way, to have protests where, where no one wears a mask uh, during <laughs> yes. uh, and, and 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 break curfews uh, that have been legally set. So so you can do that and still give money to the Amazon network. But but what I mean, what broke the camel's back? Yeah, I suppose. What, what, but so basically, eventually, we I know what it was, but it took them about two years oh, too. It's unbelievable, late. and we've been talking about this. I mean, it is kind of. Ex- Extraordinary. So Black Lives Matter, you know, Black Lives Matter Foundation is a 501c3, like we are a 501c3. And if you're a 501c3, your accounting has to be impeccable and you have to account for where the money goes. And the people who gave you money can go on your 990 and look at exactly what what you've done and what you haven't done. So Black Lives Matter decided they wouldn't bother doing that, mm-hmm. basically. And so they collected an enormous sum of money, $90 million. 60, basically, round, I'm just rounding up the numbers here, around $90 million in the last two years, $60 million of which they can't account for and won't account for. And so Amazon have thrown them off. But here, you know, I, I know, I know we're, there's a ton of points to be made here. The main point I want to make just off the bat is I find it deeply depressing that NBC News, ABC News, didn't lead with this when it when it broke yesterday. 
they didn't lead with this story. Well, this story has been bubbling under for for months now because no one, I mean, Patrice Cullors, who's a co-founder of BLM, did she buy four houses or five houses? I can't remember. And when it was reported in the New York Post, Twitter uh, cancelled the tweet because it was revealing private information uh, about someone's house. And it's like, no, it's actually re revealing public information about someone who has uh, who has a very public profile and where her where she's bought her houses are a matter of public record. But I mean, there's, there's all these questions that could be asked by journalists. Like, um, did they not bother to publish the 990s or have they give, have they stolen all the money and their, they, they, and their accountants can't? publish the, 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 the accounts because it, there's no there there. And the second one thing is, where does this 60 million figure come out of, or this 90 million figure come out of? I've seen it, right? But no one's ever said how we know it was 60 million. And look, the, I know Hollywood celebrities who would give BLM 50 million. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I bet it's 600 million. Yeah. I bet it's a billion. You think they were, they were the most widely known political, political activist organization uh, on the planet Earth. On the planet Earth for yeah. about a year. Yeah. You think, they, year. you think they only got 60 million? So it's interesting just, and, I, and just to know, to, to see what a complete cluster this organization is. So Colors, who was one of the co-founders, one of the leaders of the organization, she stepped down back, I think back in May, I think it was, stepped down from the organization. And then she, um, you know, she appointed McCann, McCanny Tembe and Monifa Bandel to lead the organization as senior executives. But those two, Tembe and Bandel, revealed in September that they never actually took the job because of disagreements with BLM's Acting Leadership Council. Right now, today, if you go on the BLM Foundation website, there's no button for donating because they've literally had to disable it because of this massive mess that they're in right now. As you say, Phelan, they're saying, you know, basically the story that's out there is saying that there's 60 million that's not accounted for. I think it's a lot more than mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's extraordinary. Of course, Colors, when people questioned her about the ownership of all these homes, I think she owns four homes or bought four homes within a 12 month period. You know, she said it was deep concerning that people don't have blind faith in BLM's stewardship of its 60 million charitable bankroll and she suggested that critics in the media in black media aren't actually black. I thought well, that was As really Joe good. Biden said if, you, if, you, if you're black and you don't support him you're not really you're black. not really black so really anyway, extraordinary. i mean but it's a story can i just say it is a story we're going to come back to and great reporting by the way done by the washington examiner on this story by andrew Kerr. for anyone who wants to check that story out but you're not going to find it's a story you are not going to find but, in the mainstream but media, if and you, you should if you send charitable money to the ottawa truckers yes through give send go and your address not, is going to get your, doxed. Address, your address is going to get doxed, you're going to lose your job you're going to be threatened your business, you're going to, is going to be your business is going to be closed the truckers themselves, they're going to have their assets seized, their bank accounts frozen. Anyone who supports it is going to have their bank accounts frozen. And no frozen. leader in the world has come out and spoken against against Trudeau and his administration, as his tyr his tyrannical administration, who are doing these unconscionable things that the whole world is watching and thinking, why is no one speaking out about this? The idea that these... And by the way, these protesters, I have not heard of anybody getting hurt or anyone dying. We yeah. know that, for example, during the BLM riots, uh, I think it was about 70 people in the end that died, that lost their lives. Billions of dollars in lost property. No seizing and, bank accounts there, no... Uh, and according to CNN, there were mostly peaceful protests. Mostly but peaceful. apparently the truckers don't get that Talking of CNN, CNN I want to wrap up I want to wrap up today uh, the, the show with a, a little, a little ah, CNN a little story. CNN, well, story. CNN is uh, imploding, as you know. Jeff Zucker has had to resign, the, the, the sort of the, the puppet master at CNN. His uh, lover slash fellow senior executive, Miss Gollus, has had to resign. But the New York Times did a story on it. And yes, it's got some great detail. Finally, they've come to the party uh, after, after it was basically they were forced to. But I mean, even then, they just won't, they won't, they won't tell the truth. You know, they talk about the pandemic being a great opportunity for CNN. It highlighted Mr. Zucker's competitive uh, instincts. And he'd already barred Chris Cuomo from interviewing his brother, Governor Cuomo. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, I'm, you know, I'm not a huge fan. Hello, it's Top, yes, Cat. Top Cat. Yes. I'm not a huge critic of Chris Cuomo interviewing his brother. You know, provided they say at the start, my brother, Governor yes. Cuomo, right? Yes. And people can make up their own minds whether this is a fair interview or not. You know, and, but you know, 
I know it's a news program, but everyone knows it's not really a news program. It's an opinion program. So with opinion programs, you've got more la- leeway, more latitude. And he was previously on a kind of a magazine program in the morning. Again, it's not hard news. So relax yourself down to a panic. You know, uh, as long as it's clear this is a brother interviewing a brother, it's it can be interesting. Um, so during the pandemic, he relaxed the rules. Chris could now interview his brother. Uh, and But then they say, you know, Chris, Chris got... COVID and I remember that well and he quarantined in his cellar and then they did this great story about Chris after two weeks coming remember that running up the stairs I'm back cleared by CDC a little sweaty just worked out it happens ah thank you this is for when we go outside um that's what we have to do now all of us in New York so anyway I'm back let's get after it and look the reality is uh Chris Cuomo was spotted out on a bicycle, he was spotted out driving around. He was spotted out uh, looking at his house in the Hamptons. Looking at his house in the Hamptons that's been built, talking to builders whilst he had COVID. So the coming, I'm coming out of quarantine. It was a lie, was an absolute lie. And the New York Times didn't bother pointing York, that out. Yeah, and and there's, I think there's even photographs of him out being out and about. And he even talked about getting into a fight with some guy who said you should be in quarantine. And he talked about it on a radio yeah. show. So yeah. he admits that. But but then CNN, as you said, the worst thing actually is that the news organization, that apparently, you know, the news organization, CNN, uh, uh, you know, they call themselves a news mm. organization, you know, covered this, had a, you know, had a film crew go out there to film him re-emerging from the cellar yeah. when they actually knew from the basement, when they actually knew it was complete fake. nonsense. It's actually the genuine example of fake news. Yeah. It's faked, it's fraud. Anyway, on that happy note, we are going to uh, mosey on and uh, we will see you again next week. And uh, please don't forget to leave your comments. uh, And thank you for people who've written. I'm still getting more fabulous suggestions for what to do with the lemons. And I got, I know Catherine sent me a really lovely message. I haven't got it with me right now, but a beautiful, another mess, another great recipe uh, idea. So very, very happy with all of those recipe ideas and uh, they will be coming at you very soon. Very soon. So uh, we're getting a lot of messages actually and we're going to, re- maybe next week we'll read some messages. Yeah. We've got a great message from someone in County Donegal, Ireland. Yes. We've got other messages from other people about just stories that they know and, uh, you know, experiences they've had and uh, we'll, we'll devote some time to that next week. And by the time we come to you next week, we'll be, um, I'll have finished my third stand-up routine. So wish me luck on that. Oh yes, yeah, so if you're going to be in L.A., what? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. Listen, Anne. Yes. We'll, we'll keep you posted. We'll keep you we posted. We might even bring a little bit of footage of that yes. if we get some. In time. Okay. Thank you. Thank All the you best. So much. Bye. Bye.